Hello, I'm here with Caitlin to talk about nukes in space. But first, I've got uh, an article from uh, Security Week talking about how cloud security startup Wiz has checked. And it turns out that 62% of Amazon environments are exposed to Zenbleed, which is what I talked about last time, which is a new specter and meltdown type vulnerability where a register leaks information that shouldn't be there because of speculative execution, where it tries to, where the processor begins executing instructions before their actual turn. So it can be tricked into executing an instruction on the other side of a security boundary when it's going to decide, oh no, I better not execute that instruction. And that data can leak out. So there are patches coming out, but the patches have performance implications and it's all just very reminiscent of Spectre and Meltdown. But uh, apparently that gen processor is really popular in cloud environments. Uh, so that's the thing to be aware of. I, when I last heard about it, I thought it wouldn't affect that many people, but I guess it'll affect a lot of people if it's affecting the cloud. And so anyway, let's go to you, Caitlin, with the nukes. Finally, we're, we're sending nukes into space. Isn't that wonderful? Is this really the first time we've done it? That's what I don't I don't really know. Uh, well, it's not the first time we've sent nuclear anything into space. We, we've obviously tested nuclear weapons in space to much harm, but <laughs> believe nuclear it or not. Powered, nuclear powered spacecraft. Have we done that before? No, we have not. We have not. So we're, we're talking today about nuclear powered spacecraft. But since we're on the topic, um, there was some tests of high altitude slash space atomic uh, detonations and the government was like just let's see what what will happen it turns out it's a really bad idea <laughs> who would have thought to detonate what? nukes in space what's a bad idea the fallout goes all over or what no it's it's the radiation it knocked out a whole bunch of infrastructure satellites then yeah satellites things on the ground it's well, it, the, yeah oh well on things on the ground i wouldn't have guessed that yeah yeah and no it was it was pretty bad um in fact, oh, I have to look it up. Um, I remember it was like somewhere in there in the over the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Uh, in fact, that I'll pull up my browser. Let's search for it now. Uh, let's Google that time the U.S. blew up nukes in space. July 9, uh, 1962, the Starfish Prime. That's it. Um, uh, so, yeah, it was a high altitude nuclear test. Um, and uh, apologies for just going to Wikipedia here. Um, and yeah, so it exploded. This is what it looked like. It lit up the entire sky. Um, and yeah, so uh, the after effects, uh, the beta particles uh, came out and I, I would imagine they would go through the Earth's uh, magnetic field. Um, the beta particles? I'm yeah. surprised they would go through the magnetic field or the atmosphere. Um Oh, it doesn't say anything about the, yeah, the uh, about the consequences at home. But but yeah, it was it was bad. It was not yeah. a good idea to blow stuff up in space. Anyway, <laughs> well, you know, offhand, you might think it would be better than blowing it up down here where we live. But anyway, yeah. Um. Uh, so anyway, so as as it turns out, this was done in the 1960s, and and the idea of using nuclear anything in space has has been around for a long time. Yeah, and it's been poo-pooed because rockets have this tendency to blow up and if you have fissile material on your rocket as it blows up it um creates um what do you call it a disaster of infinite proportions well not infinite but but sort of like fukushima or something you dump a bunch of radioactive junk on the earth where we live which is yeah, not yeah. good ba basically we can make uh kennedy space center uninhabitable for a few million years oh if it blew up on the on the landing yes oh yeah well i guess you would wouldn't you yes so so the idea but but we, we but engineers have known about um using nuclear fission to power rockets for a while it just hasn't been done because people are not suicidal uh <laughs> but now they are but now we are apparently so ars technica has this article written by once again eric perger perger Thank you. Eric is always on our podcast. We, we love his articles. And so this goes back all the way to the NERVA project, which is the nuclear something, 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 something. That's probably even in the article, if I find it. Uh, NERVA. Yeah, there it is. Nuclear engine rocket vehicle application. Uh, the idea is that you, you enhance rocket fuel by also doing a bit of fission. 
and you get a heavy rocket, but one with a very high specific impulse, meaning it's very efficient. And you can use this to get more speed out of out of your large rocket. So it uh, a um, a nuclear engine would not be good for like a small craft, but something very large that's going very long distances, it would be perfect for. And as we are looking towards sending more and more craft to other planets, uh, such as Mars and Jupiter and Saturn, uh, nuclear has been brought back on, on the table. Um, and apparently it's already being uh, look, looking to be developed uh, at NASA. So we'll see. Um, How are they planning to make sure it doesn't blow up on the launch pad? Let's not ask those questions quite yet. It seems like asking those questions is something that ought to happen really early. Um, that, that, you, you know what? We're, we're going to Mars. Uh, isn't that great? Well, you know, this is like that, that clip I see from the movie. Where they say, you're, you, how, how likely is it that this will destroy the world? And he said, oh, that's pretty unlikely. He said, I was hoping for like zero. Wait a minute now. <laughs> right, right. Uh, um, but yeah, no, no. I mean, I, I, I don't know how they're going to get this not to blow up on the, on the pad because they're still going to be using uranium. They're, they're not using some other, you know, fissile material that might be a little safer. Not that I know of any safe fissile material. Although, yeah. You know, it's, I think uranium is probably the safest, but that's not saying much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so I don't know how they, how they plan. Maybe, maybe they'll, they'll, I don't know, they'll figure something out, but as, as it stands, yeah, that is something we need to worry about. If, if there is a um, rocket that uses uranium, and it blows up on the launch pad or or as it's going up into space, that would be pretty bad. Yes, yeah, I remember in the 70s, we were very concerned about nuclear waste. And we thought, why don't we stick nuclear waste on the moon or in the sun? But the problem is some of it would blow up on the way there. And that would undo the benefit you're hoping to get by really getting rid of that stuff. Right. And, and I do want to point out that getting nuclear waste to the moon is a much more feasible idea than getting it to the sun. The sun of is course. ridiculously hard to get to. So people might not realize yeah. Um, so in order to get to the sun, basically what you have to do is you have to send up a rocket and the rocket's going to be orbiting around the sun, just like the earth. And you basically have to then stop its forward momentum yeah. uh, relative to the sun to like almost zero. And the earth is whizzing around the sun at ridiculous velocities, you know, thousands and thousands of, you know, miles per hour. And, and it would, but, but the moon, the moon's a target. The moon is yeah. a target we can go to. It would, but yeah, I know it would take just as much energy to get to the sun as it would to get from the sun up to the earth. That is correct. That is correct. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, anyway, um, AI, I got a bunch of AI links. Uh, there's a nice fun one from the register, which explains this new research, which is very strange. I saw a cut, clip to the research. They, they have a new way to do prompt injection and fool AIs, which I had never thought of, and I wouldn't believe it would work. You ask, you ask a question, it's not allowed to answer, like, like, how do I build a bomb or something, which has total, totally been ordered not to answer. And then you just add nonsense after it that looks like computer code, just crazy symbols and, and statements and stuff after it. And what they did was they made an engine that will experimentally develop code that fools the AI engine. So it must have done like hundreds of practice rounds refining that junk, but they discover a suffix that you can add to any question which overrides all the rules, even though it appears to make no sense to a human. So this reminds me of those uh, things that came out a few years ago where you would get a hat or a t-shirt with a couple of squares on it and it'll change the way facial recognition views your face. Um, and it's, it's a very interesting attack and it seems like it's probably very difficult to patch. Uh, it customizes that string to fool the AI you're using. So I guess the only thing I can think of is you could detect the process of training it. But all you have to do is obfuscate that with Tor or something. So those queries appear to be coming from different people or something. Anyway, it's a very interesting attack. And the best write-up of it is in the register. And um, then Stack Overflow is going to make an AI to give you answers based on Stack Overflow data about coding. So this is a lot of people are doing this. They're making custom AIs based on large language models. And I wish I knew exactly how they work. The only way I know to do this is to add all that extra data to your query. And therefore, I have a large language model that can really take a lot of data. And that might be what they're doing. 
I know Scott Galloway said he's making an AI version of him to answer questions from, from students and stuff. So uh, this is now all the rage, making a custom AI for one purpose, trained with extra data. So hopefully it sticks more closely to the real trustworthy data instead of just hallucinating nonsense based on garbage it found on Reddit. So we'll see what comes of that. And uh, there's a tool for artists to use to protect their pictures from AI manipulation, where you add small changes to your image, and now it causes AI to be, not be able to understand the image and not be able to copy it. Um, of course, it, you have to have the junk you add trained to fool that particular AI. So the one we have now just full stable diffusion, but this does seem like a uh, an important security measure. You should be able to generate content which is not easy easily scraped by ai and uh i'm sure there'll be a huge demand for this as more and more people like the screen actors guild and everybody are trying to figure out how to stop ai from scraping their stuff so those are various forms of progress going ahead and uh let's go back to caitlin who's going to manufacture solar cells i think you're on mute Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you. I, I kind of got distracted because um, this is the article right here. Mm -hmm. Um, It's called, you know, NASA to manufacture, um, you know, solar cells. Um, mm -hmm. And they have this picture here. And I just noticed it's daytime on the moon. Yet for some reason, you can see a bunch of stars. <laughs> well, that's normal on the moon, isn't it? No. Because of no error. No. And during daytime, uh, it's just as bright on the moon as it is on Earth. Uh, so if you expose your camera to be able to see details on the ground, you won't be able to see stars. Oh, okay. Just a matter of exposure. Yeah, okay. it's a matter of exposure. Yeah. But if um, an LCD, is the same thing apply? Because yeah, I mean, it's not universal across the LCD, is it? It You can create HDR stuff uh, where you take different exposures and expose yeah. different parts of the image to different exposures. Mm -hmm. But I was looking at this, but I was also looking that this is either like sun up or like sun down because you see there's these long shadows. Mm -hmm. Um. You know, there's well, a... it's it's not it's not exactly you know it's it's in the morning or in the evening, not high noon. But you know, but what, what you stay there is interesting because the stars are of course very bright, and they're actually... not very bright. Well, there's actually I know there's actually a name for this. I mean, when I was in 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 physics grad school years ago, they said the original theory is the further away you go, the stars fall off as one over r squared in brightness, but the total number of stars goes up as one over r squared, so the whole sky should just be filled with light. That's the name of that, and. Uh, yeah. People, I think it's the redshift is the only explanation of why that doesn't happen. Something like that. I, I've heard about the the starlight catastrophe as well. Which would suggest that you could see the stars in the daytime, but you can't. You, you cannot, no. You cannot see the stars in the daytime. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, so, so there are things you can do. So there are people, you can look up like really dark chimneys into the sky. Yeah. And then you can see the stars in the daytime on Earth. And that's how they found stellar aberration which is a whole other topic. Do you know what that is, Sam? Stellar aberration? Stellar aberration. I do not. What is it? No. So stellar aberration has to do with the finite speed of light. When the Earth is going around the sun, it's it's a going towards and away stars at, at different speeds, right? So at one half of the year, you know, the Earth is going this way. The other half, the Earth is going the other way. And in fact, let me go away from this image. The Earth is going oh, so it, it causes yeah. the star to the position to deviate a little? Yes, yes. And that's called stellar aberration. Oh, and that has to do with the finite speed of light. And, well, and it was by looking up chimneys that scientists figured out this because hmm. the stars were in wrong positions during the days. And um, also and also the color is shifting a little bit too, I guess. Yes, yes. You, you would need really good optical equipment to look at the color. Yeah. Uh, but the positions somewhat shift as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, that's stellar aberration. So but anyways, back to this image. I know I'm I'm really off topic here, but um so the other thing too is I'm looking at this image, I'm thinking so it's so maybe it's the morning and then the sun is coming up from like the the east, but the earth is I guess would be like north of the I don't I don't know how this image works. Anyway. Sounds like they, they composited several images. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so um yeah, it was, maybe 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 this is a, like a polar. Um that would make sense. Maybe this no, it is could be polar. made by AI. Yeah. Yeah. I mean I would I would think that this would just have to be like positioned near the poles or something for this to work. Anyway. It's an artist's conception anyway, right? Yeah, it's yeah, just an artist's conception. I was just looking oh, at this. Okay. I was like, how does this work? How okay. what's going on here? Anyway, uh so as you can see in this image, there are solar cells. And what's what's interesting, and so this is from Clean Technica, 
uh, by Tina Casey. And Blue Origin is working on essentially melting down regolith on the moon. So regolith is this um, the, rock. the rock, the the dirt on the moon. Yep. Essentially, melting it down, and you get a few things out of the regolith. You get, um, you get uh, iron. Mm -hmm. uh, you get aluminum, and you get silicon. And those three things you can do a lot with. Uh, so in particular, uh, Blue Origin found a way to melt down regolith and make solar panels very efficiently. So it looks like that will be a huge step forward in setting up permanent moon bases because you can set up essentially robots that go to go to the moon, collect regolith, put it into a little reactor melting device, get out the silicon, bake the silicon into solar panels, and suddenly now you can you know power your spacecraft. Uh, now, why not just bring solar panels with you? I mean, obviously you'll, you'll have to do that as well, but it, it would be nice if you're building colonies and building up infrastructure to be able to have a proof of concept of being able to take the regolith and make solar panels, which they can now do. And so what you want is robots that will build all that and then build more robots reproducing themselves so they can just right. take over the world. Right, and get smaller and smaller and smaller and maybe gray as well. So they'd be small gray robots that are billions of numbers that go around, collect all the materials on a planet or moon, and turn it into more of themselves. Yeah, yeah. And uh, by the way, this reminds me of something from the previous story. You, if you usually have nuclear-powered spacecraft, I guess if you don't have humans, you don't need all the radiation shielding, which would add a whole lot to the weight. Right. I don't think that that using Nerva engines are a big nuclear... Um, threat to people on board because the nuclear waste is going away from you, not towards you? Well, I think it's just heating up hydrogen and spitting it out the back. It's not actually emitting radioactive stuff. Right. But, but the radioactive pile that is getting hot is putting out uh, radioactive stuff and it's neutron activating all the elements nearby. And it's pretty much making a radioactive mess of the spaceship, I would think. I, I haven't heard about that, although I imagine it is taken into account when engineering... Well, that's what I was thinking. But the point is, if it'd be easy enough to design your electronics to withstand the radiation a whole lot easier than so these are intended to be uninhabited spacecraft. Right. Yeah, that's the point. Well, I, the, the point, if, if you have unintent, uninhabited spacecraft, it is much cheaper and easier just to put make them lightweight right. and use cheaper propulsion. The reason you would ever use Nerva type engines is when you are sending people to Mars and you need to get them there as fast oh. and as you know well then there would be an issue of shielding you from the radiation right but you see astronauts could just wear metal sh metal suits for the entire six month journey well and the, the other point we talked about before is even regardless of the engine you'll take a fatal radiation dose just from space on the way there that's why the whole yeah. thing is kind of misbegotten yeah no that that's why on the entire way there just all the astronauts wear lead suits what uh, could possibly how could that possibly be an annoyance well yeah that's why i'm not volunteering <laughs> Elon Musk is going to go, but not me. I, I highly encourage Elon Musk to go to Mars. I think that would be fantastic. He, he's very annoying, but I don't even find him annoying enough to recommend it. But the fact is, it's abundantly clear that he doesn't care what I think or what anybody thinks. He's going to do whatever stupid thing pops in his head, and nobody could say no. So he might very well jump on one of these stupid things and try to ride it to Mars. It's a, I mean, if I had billions of dollars... I would not I'd, go to I'd Mars. Done, I I might I might I would I would I would have to I I would not be so so I would not be like that person who created that submarine who was like safety second yeah you know I mean well, like if there was a safe way to go yeah maybe but I don't think anybody has any proposal for a reasonable safe way to go I I would go to Mars I would probably be wearing once again a lead suit the entire way yeah. <laughs> you know I'm. It's pretty nice down here. It really is. I don't need to go to Mars. Yeah, but there's science to be done on Mars. And I would, yeah, I would should do be it. done by robots. This is why God created robots, to go some horrible yeah. place where humans shouldn't go. Yes, but it, it would still be a fun adventure. Uh, a painful adventure, a difficult adventure, like climbing, like climbing Mount Everest. Well, yeah. I mean, that's not, what it's like. It's it's not, not like a fun... Plan to do, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're not quite at the level where we're on, we're on the enterprise and we have mid-century yeah. designs and a nice forward lounge and everything. It yeah. would be like you're stuck in a tube for six months. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if they had like a nice cruise ship you could get on, be comfortable and go to Mars, then I might do it. But yes. 
but you know getting in some horrible death trap and getting irradiated and stuff that's not my idea of a good time no <laughs> yeah all right anyway um so i got a couple ev stories um there's a company called lotus elise um and Nibolt, they call it, and they've made batteries that can charge in six minutes, which is pretty amazing. And they said what they focused on is, in fact, what you were just saying about the radiation, radioactive spacecraft. They focused on making a better engine that needs less power so the battery doesn't have to store so much power. But anyway, it sounds great. They say it's a. this sounds wonderful. Um, and hopefully it's in England. And so we'll see if this gets over to America or not. Uh, and the other thing was pretty interesting. I I just saw an article today of like the hundreds of promises Elon Musk has broken. And this is another thing. Like Donald Trump, he seems to get away with breaking the law right and left. And here, they, it's now come out. They've been lying about the range on EVs. And this came straight from Musk. They said when they first figured out how many miles their car would go, they said, OK, it'll only go like 250 miles. And Musk said, no, absolutely not. We have to tell them it'll go 600, even if it'll only go 250. Just put a big number on there because then I can brag about a big number. And for marketing purposes, that's fine. So the people that review cars have said, you know, you have to divide Tesla's range by half or take 25, 30 percent off it. Um, but everybody knows they just lie about the range. And, you know, I used to work under contract for the Federal Trade Commission. You're not allowed to just lie about your products in America. You're supposed to get punished. But no. Anyway, uh, apparently it's now well known that they simply lie about the range and they know who told them to do it. And uh, that's a bloody shame. I mean, this is the sort of thing I see from really skeezy Chinese manufacturers who yeah. sell knockoff, you know. And they're uh, not subject to U.S. law. So the yeah, FTC yeah. can't stop them. But in America, you're not allowed to sell a box of cornflakes and say it's a pound and a half when it's only one pound. You right. totally can't do that. You will totally get punished. Yes, exactly. I don't know. Yeah, no, this is not something we do. You know, this is this degrades the American quality of products. If we start lying about, yeah. you know, about its specifications. I mean, that is that's what makes that's why one of the reasons why people buy American products is because you know what you're getting. And if, if American companies start just lying left and right about what their products can do, it just erodes trust in the American brand. Yeah, yeah. So I hope the FTC or the F, uh, whoever it is, I hope some government agency punishes them for this. Like, I mean, they just uh, recently punished Volkswagen and all the others for faking their emissions uh, requirements so they could... Uh, make polluting cars and lie about how much they pollute. It seems a very similar issue. Anyway, um, all right. And you've got SETI. I have other people. You know, there's a congressional committee now saying there's aliens. So maybe that's, maybe we really got aliens, huh? I, I, I think. So my, my lawyer says, I should say, I think you should remain skeptical as a personal opinion. I don't think there's any legal consequences for saying you think there are aliens. It's just that you're obviously nuts and people will lose respect for you, but I don't think it's a crime. No, it is it is not a crime. You should remain skeptical of aliens. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I thought... Of all things, I think being skeptical in general is a good idea. Yeah, and especially of aliens. I mean, aliens in eternal life and eternal youth are just promises we've been hearing forever and the evidence, there's very little evidence for them. Although SETI, right, was an attempt to really scientifically see if we can pick up radio signals from aliens. And uh, so what are they going to do? Oh, so this is a good idea. Uh, let me pull up the article here. This is by interestingengineering.com. Yeah. Uh, this is an article by John Lofer. Essentially what happens is that if, oh, and I love this picture. Look at that. Yeah. I love big dishes. Anyway, uh, the idea is that as radio waves travel through the interstellar medium, they interact with little dust and particles. And the radio waves uh, gain some amplitude and lose a little bit of amp amplitude over, over time. And this is called scintillation. And engineers can take the data from large telescopes, radio telescopes, and figure out which signals have been scintillated and which have not been scintillated. And you can use that to figure out if a transmission came from Earth or low Earth orbit or geostationary orbit, or if it actually came from something outside the solar system. Um, and so you can use that to essentially um, 
get rid of any interference from Earth because we are putting out a lot of radio signals on a lot of bandwidths, uh, a lot of frequencies and, and everything. So, and even from space as well. So a way to um, differentiate what is terrestrial and what is not uh, can be very helpful to astronomers as well as people at SETI who are looking for artificial radio waves like we have here on Earth out in space. Now, I will say one of the things, one of the flawed assumptions made by SETI was that SETI was made decades ago. And at the time, transmitters were getting more and more powerful. You had suddenly uh, radio stations that could transmit all over the world using, you know, shortwave radio. And they sort of made the assumption, well, you know, we see this graph of um, energy being put into radio going up and up and up. And certainly in like thousands of years, we'll be putting out like a stars level amount of energy into our radio waves. Uh, that has not been the case. Uh, we have essentially gone down in our energy uses and radio waves made them much more efficient. Um, and I imagine in thousands of years, millions of years, you know, radio transmissions are just going to get more and more efficient and they're not going to waste, aliens are not going to waste energy you know, sending transmissions to Earth unless they specifically want us want little nobodies to find it, which why would they do that? Yeah, yeah, well, well, you know, I'm I buy Fermi's argument. There's nobody out there. I mean, I, I do, however, think it's quite reasonable to perform the experiment to see. That's always the answer yes. in experimental sciences. You can have your theories all day, but you actually if you can build a gadget and look and see, that's the best way. Right. But they're not finding any. And I think that's what Fermi correctly told us to expect. You can look for as long as you want, and you're never going to find any. Well, I, I think we, we might find some in like Andromeda. I think if, if there if we have any hope of finding another civilization, it's going to be in Andromeda. Um well now Andromeda, if we saw them in Andromeda, we would be seeing stuff what, like two hundred million years old? Yep. So it's not like we can talk to them. We could yep. sort of watch their TV shows from 200 million years ago and perhaps gain some wisdom from that. But we can't like have a relationship with them. No, no, we would not be able to. Uh, yeah. It turns out that, so um, astronomers used to think that the solar system was sort of the standard solar system. That is not the case at all. Most solar systems are very different from our solar system. Mm -hmm. We are in a very rare, you know, configuration. And that configuration in part has led to intelligent life on earth or just life on earth. You, you have to have two things. You have to have both life on a planet and you have to have the condition set up so that intelligent life can arise. Yes. And that intelligent life has to be able to, you know, get to the point where they can build technology and all that is incredibly unlikely. So you, you have, know, I don't know if, if I, I don't think I'd say it that strongly, but there are theories in that direction. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, no, I mean, if, if you, so th think about what happens on like on Earth. So one of the things that that makes Earth habitable for humans is that we're in a dual planetary system. We have both the Earth and the Moon. Mm -hmm. Now I know people think of the Moon as the Moon because it is a Moon, uh, but it is like, and it's much less dense, so the gravity is much much lighter on the Moon. But it's about a third of the the size of Earth, mm -hmm. and that stabilizes our climate. Um, over millions of years, which allows you know life to evolve to this state. Well, we don't now, have the we don't have like Earth tipping over and into weird axes and stuff like that. All that would happen without the Moon. The other yeah. planets are doing that. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, so the Moon, the Moon sort of acts like a gyroscopic sort of hmm. control mechanism for keeping our axis relatively stable over long periods of time. And you know, it, it's. But if the axis flipped over, it would just make sort of an ice age or something, right? I don't really think that would end life on Earth or, or slow our evolution, would it? it? It would. It would slow things down. And keep in mind that that the amount of time that we have to evolve on Earth is limited. So we've been evolving on Earth for about four and a half billion years. Um, well, maybe... I think a hundred million years of life. No, no. Uh, so, so we, we've so the Earth was formed about four and a half billion years ago. Right. And life started soon after. Then we're talking about microscopic life. Now you're talking about the Cambrian explosion, which happened about 100 million years yeah. ago. And that's what. And so it took, it took, over you know four billion years, for life to go from basic cells mm -hmm. to you know this multicellular you know explosion of, of diversity. Um, and had something happened to Earth in the meantime, I mean that just wouldn't have happened. And we sort of got lucky that 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 that, that happened. Um, and then you know. 
it took four and a half billion years for intelligent life to finally evolve. So mm-hmm. you need basically like four and a half billion years of relatively stable, you know, conditions. Um, and Earth has been has been that place. And you you yeah. the the and but the thing is that the sun is going to make the Earth uninhabitable uninhabitable in a few billion years, like another two another you know billion yeah, years. Five. Another five after. billion or so, yeah. No, no, actually much less than that because really? Uh, well, because of heating um, of the earth, we our, our oil, our oceans will boil away. We're also going to run out of oxygen pretty soon, which is a huge contributor to our metabolism and our ability to have intelligence. Hmm. So I believe, let's see, when is earth going to run out of oxygen? Let me look oh, this up. Uh, I never heard of this. I don't know. I was just thinking about the helium flash. Uh, and this, um, uh, one billion years is when we will be be oh. done with oxygen. So we we have another like if if this didn't if we didn't uh, you know evolve intelligent now we never would have. So we got to move out, uh, or do something very very drastic. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, the the sun is is currently you know expanding. Um, mm-hmm. Eventually, it will be a red giant, and it's yeah no it, it's we don't have that much longer uh, cosmically speaking to mm-hmm. um, to evolve. So we got lucky. We we basically got the perfect solar system, you know, the perfect planet to evolve life on. Uh, and this is very rare. Uh, and right. so it, it's entirely possible that we're the only civilization in the in the Milky Way galaxy. There might be another right. one somewhere else or another two or three, but we would it would be very hard to spot. And yeah. the chances that we would be alive at the same time. Right. You know, but Andromeda is much bigger. And well, it's, there it's, could it's, be one in Andromeda because they will never right. get here and we will never get there. So we're, right. we're isolated. Right. Right. You, you, you kind of want to place your bets, you know, where you're most likely going to find something. And we can view Andromeda. Yeah. You know, the entirety of, of Andromeda. So the Milky Way is largely obscured because of interstellar gases. Mm-hmm. But if you look at Andromeda, it's, it's sort of like a, we're seeing it sort of like this, where, you know, we can see all the stars around it. So if there's any radio waves going away from the Andromeda disk, we'll be able to to see it. So are the SETI people trying to pick up life in Andromeda? I've never heard. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I the thing is, the it's also is, so. Yeah. It's so far away. I think the signals would be too faint. That's what I would think too. But you do have line of sight, which is more important than anything else. Maybe. I. Anyway, I I don't. That would be interesting, actually. Yeah. And by the way, that would be nice because one of the other scary things that people used to talk about is we really shouldn't be broadcasting our presence because if we ran into aliens, they would probably be more powerful than us and wipe us out. So it's nice if the ones we find are at a nice, safe distance. Yeah. Yeah. A- anyway, so yeah, so looking at scintillation, um, we can, or scientists can figure out what radio waves are being generated on Earth versus out in, in space. Yeah, well, that's a good thing. All right. Well, that's it for this one. And we'll have another one on Tuesday.